want to welcome you to our Bible study tonight, uh, Exploring God's Word. I am Pastor Neil Tedford, and we want to continue with our lesson here in Exploring God's Word, and lesson number five, and we're going to be talking about the, the promised land uh, in the Old Testament, and how uh, the Israelites uh, possessed the promised land, uh, and uh, they went on to subdue the land uh, and uh, establish the kingdom of Israel within the promised land. Uh, last time we talked about Moses and how uh, God had commanded him to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. Uh, and this tabernacle in the wilderness is vital for us to understand today in our time, even though it happened many thousands of years ago, uh, what it did was point directly to the coming of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for us. You see, God doesn't do anything by accident. He doesn't make up things as he goes along, but he has a plan uh, that he is unfolding uh, over many, many generations uh, to ultimately bring mankind back into relationship with him. Uh, what he created in the beginning uh, he created man, male and female, made man in, in his image uh, in order to have a relationship with man. And he desires a relationship with you and I. Uh, and uh, when that relationship with Adam and Eve, the first, the first couple, was, was, uh, was destroyed because of sin and their rebellion in the garden, uh, God began the process of bringing mankind back to himself. And from our standpoint, it's been a long process. But ultimately, God is calling mankind back to himself. And we see this beautifully illustrated within the tabernacle and how it foreshadowed uh, the sacrifice of Christ uh, and, and how that sacrifice of Christ is vital today for those that desire to be saved. No one can be saved outside of Jesus Christ. Uh, so today we're going to look at the, the promised land. Uh, and uh, after Moses, we see that Israel was commanded to go into the promised land. Moses did not go into the promised land, but he, he died uh, on Mount Nebo. Uh, ultimately, Moses did go into the promised land uh, because we know that uh, at Jesus' transfiguration in the New Testament, Elijah and Moses appeared, and that was within the promised land. But within his lifetime here on earth, Moses did not go into the promised land. It was left to Joshua to take the people of Israel into this promised land. And uh, God was looking for a man of faith that he could use, and he found such a man in Joshua. As a younger man, it was Joshua that said, we are well able to go and possess this land, the promised land. Um, in order to begin their journey into possessing this land of promise, uh, they had to cross the Jordan River. The Jordan River runs uh, from the north here in the Sea of Galilee on down through here into the Dead Sea. Uh, and uh, this was the, this was the uh, line, the, the, uh, the river that they needed to cross in order to begin uh, possessing the land of promise. Uh, when the priests who were holding the Ark of the Covenant uh, stepped into the Jordan River, uh, the waters divided similar to how they divided in the Red Sea. Uh, and as the priests stood there in the riverbed, uh, the Israelites crossed over into uh, the Promised Land at Gilgal. And uh, before they left, though, they had 12 men pick 12, uh, 12 large stones, and they put these 12 stones in the middle of the river as a memorial uh, of the victorious passing uh, of the people of Israel into their promised land. Uh, in generations to come, when they would ask, what do those stones mean? Then it would give, uh, it would give the grandparents, parents, uh, uh, 
the, it, the insight to say those stones was, uh, were put up when we crossed the, uh, the Jordan River in, in taking and possessing this promised land. And so for generations then, uh, children and children's children could be reminded of the great deliverance that God was bringing into their nation. Uh, somebody described our memories as the jewel box of the mind. Uh, and this term is true only if, if it contains beautiful things, true things, things that are good. You know, ugly things are not meant for jewel boxes. Uh, and the memory of wrong deeds and unkind words or evil thoughts will bring no happiness in the days to come. Uh, and so it's important to live in such a way that today's actions will become tomorrow's memories in future years. Philippians 4.8 says it this way, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, think on these things. Uh, and, and, and so let's build some good memories. Uh, well, this crossing in the Jordan River was a good memory in the nation of Israel. It was, it was a reminder of God's great deliverance and his fulfillment of promise. promise. And uh, as they were entering into the promised land, uh, they would have warfare, they would have trials, they would have mountaintop experiences, they would have valleys uh, where they faced uh, difficulties. And so it is with us. Though we're not really possessing a promised land, we are possessing spiritual promises. We are uh, needing to step out by faith and believe God for uh, things of the Holy Ghost and gifts of the Spirit and, and things that God desires to do in our lives and uh, do through us and use us for. And this all takes faith. Unbelief caused thousands of Israelites to perish in the wilderness before they reached the Jordan River and crossed. And so it is today, millions of people through unbelief are not receiving the Holy Spirit. It's God's promise and God desires for them to receive the Holy Spirit in all of his promises, but unbelief hinders too many people. Uh, when Israel went into the promised land, uh, they began first at Jericho, and this, this story of the taking of Jericho uh, and the battle there uh, is in Joshua chapter number 6. And uh, we see that in Joshua chapter number 6 that the, uh, that the uh, children of Israel were told to march around the wall one time consecutively for six, six days in a row. And uh, on the seventh day they were told to march around the city of Jericho seven times. Uh, and, uh, and that seventh day, after they marched around the wall seven times, they gave a great and mighty shout, and the walls came down. It wasn't their mighty shout that did it. It was the power of God, and it was their faith and with obedience to God that brought those walls down. God was showing Israel that he was mighty uh, if they'll just walk by faith and obey him. You know... Uh, it would seem very silly uh, for an army that is going to capture a city to march around it uh, for six days and then on the seventh day march around it seven times. But, you know, sometimes God will ask us to do things that we don't fully understand. And we can miss the promises and the victory that God has for us if we just view the things that God has asked us to do as being sillier we just because we don't understand it uh, he uh, we somehow aren't going to believe him or obey him that could cause us to miss out on what God has for us in if you have your Bibles in Joshua chapter 1 in verse number 8 uh, as they began to enter into this promised land, uh, God gave courage to Joshua, and he said in verse number 8 of Joshua chapter 1, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. God was giving Joshua courage to face the challenges uh, that he uh, inevitably would face, but he was not by himself. You know, that is, verse 8 is the only time in the, in the Bible that the word success is used. And I want you to see that success is directly tied into knowing God's word, thinking about God's word, and then acting in obedience to God's word. And so it is with us. If we desire success, let's hide this word in our heart and let's act upon this word by faith. Amen. Well, there was, there was many victories. There were some setbacks. Uh, but through it all, God helped Israel from city to city, village to village. Uh, they took the promised land from the north to the south, east and the west. They took the land and they subdued it under the leadership of Joshua. Amen. And uh, most, of the, most of the land, uh, we'll go back here and see most of the tribes, uh, it, was, it was settled, the 12 tribes settled in this area west of the Jordan River. There was a couple tribes that had settled uh, east of the Jordan River, but by and large, most of them were on this side of the Jordan River and still today, when we think of Israel, Israel is this, this piece of land here to the west of the Jordan River with the country of Jordan now, today, being on this side, Israel on this side. Uh, but uh, after Joshua passed away, it entered into a period of uh, what's called the Judges. Uh, and it's called the Judges because Israel didn't have a king at that time. And, uh, and it was a, this is a period of approximately 450 years uh, altogether. And, and uh, there was judges that God raised up at various times in order to bring uh, Israel through particular crises or uh, bring victories uh, over their enemies. And, um, uh, and it, was, it was vital for us to see that um, it was during this time uh, that, uh, that it says in Joshua 17 and 6 that in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Uh, and that's similar to how many times we, we see things happening in our world, isn't it? People doing their own thing. Uh, uh, no real absolute sense of what's right and wrong in, in, in a growing number of people. Uh, but, uh, you know, God's word never changes. His word is forever settled. And whatever my opinion, your opinion, anybody's opinion is, it doesn't change what the word of God is and what the truth of God is. You know, if I did not believe the sun will come up tomorrow morning, that's not going to change whether it comes up or not. If you don't believe that the moon is there, it's not going to change the fact that the moon is still there. Uh, you see, and, and, and even more so, believing or not believing the word of God isn't going to change it and make it untrue. Uh, but human beings, oftentimes, we just try to uh, live by our own opinions based upon our own limited experiences, our preferences, our emotions, and all kinds of things. But Jesus said the wise man is going to build his house on the rock. But when the storms come, when the difficulties come, and they will come, uh, if your house is built upon the rock, uh, then uh, you're going to stand and you're going to survive and you're going to have success, even through times of trouble. But if you're not living upon the word of God, if you're, if you're just doing what's right in your own eyes and just basing uh, your life on, 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 on opinions and on emotions and on these things, uh, that don't really matter in the long run. Ultimately, uh, when the storm comes, you're, you're building your life on sand and it's not going to withstand those hard trials and times. 
But God is calling people to build on the rock, on the foundation. We see uh, during these times right now, especially, the, how quickly economic circumstances or health circumstances or the strength of, uh, of, our, of, our, of our lives is, 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 is just hanging sometimes by just a small thread and, and how sometimes things can change just that quick. But if our lives are built upon the eternal God and his word, we're going to make it through this storm and every storm that comes. Amen. Let's not live our lives like, like those that they did what was right in their own eyes. Let's do what, what's right in God's eyes and allow the blessings of God to, to come upon us. Amen in Jesus' name. Now there's, there's several of the judges here. Uh, there's 12 judges in all. Uh, and, uh, and they did not reign continuously, but they were just called upon at particular times. And uh, there's a couple notable ones here. Deborah, she was a woman judge. Gideon uh, was a young man, lacked self-confidence, but yet he, through God's help, was able to lead an army of just 300 men to victory against the Midianites, an overwhelming army uh, uh, that would... Um, by all sense of measure, have defeated Israel easily, but God was with them. And then we, we of course, we see Josh, Samson uh, was a strong man, but he had a weak will. Uh, and so many lessons that are within these judges here that, that we could learn, but this is found within the book of Judges. The book of Ruth is also uh, taking place during this time of the Judges. All right, and then we come into a a different time frame within the, the nation of Israel. They enter into a new season <clears throat> when they begin to, to ask God for a king. Well, they, they looked around and they saw every other nation had a king and they wanted to be like everybody else. And so they demanded that God, uh, that Samuel the prophet, give them a king. Um, Samuel did not want to do that because Samuel thought of God as their king. And if God is their king, then why do they need an earthly king? Well, Israel wanted to be like everybody else. Well, these kings would ultimately uh, put taxes on them and raise their taxes and lead them into wars and all of those things. Uh, and, and things that even nowadays uh, are issues for mankind, taxes and wars and things like that. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what happened over their history. Uh, God, God gave them a king, and God called the first king. Uh, he told, told Samuel to go and anoint uh, this young man named Saul. And uh, Saul uh, was uh, very tall. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And, and uh, he, was, he was humble, and he... he uh, at first he started out very well, but then the power and the authority of his new office began to corrupt his thinking. And it began to change him from a humble servant into a proud and self-willed, jealous and disobedient uh, man. Uh, power should be treated with respect or it will blind uh, one to the truth and the will of God. This is what happened to the religious leaders in Jesus' day. They were blinded to the truth. Um, and because of their power, uh, they could not see or accept that he was the Son of God. Uh, in Saul's later years, he was filled with many mistakes uh, and that the, the bad overshadowed the good uh, that he had done. And, um, and uh, Saul's great pride prevented him from recognizing and re truly repenting when he could. Uh, God rejected Saul uh, because of his rebellious nature, and uh, God would choose another king uh, in order to uh, lead the people of Israel. But Saul did live for forty; uh, he did reign for forty years, and uh, and uh, he would be followed by uh, another king, uh, and and that would be the second king uh, in the United Kingdom, which was King David. Uh, David was anointed by Samuel when, uh, 
when uh, David was just a young man taking care of his father's sheep. Um, the highest compliment that uh, could be said of David is that he was a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22. And uh, this, this is something that we all want to, should strive to be a man or woman after God's own heart. Uh, although David sinned uh, later in his life, his desire to please God and his tenderness towards God uh, brought him to a place of repentance and restoration uh, in his walk with God. Early in his life, David was a shepherd. He cared for sheep. He fought a bear. He fought a lion that threatened his father's sheep. The spirit of the Lord came upon David, and he, he, uh, he killed those wild animals that were threatening the sheep. Uh, and when he was a little bit older, uh, he visited uh, his older brothers on the battle lines against the Philistines. And uh, David was enraged by the boasting of a particular Philistine who was a giant whose name was Goliath. And uh, he was intimidating and he was taunting day after day the Israelite army. Choose a man to fight for me, Goliath would taunt. He was, a, he was nine feet tall, they say. He had full armor on. He had a helmet of brass. He had all the, the, the chain mail uh, armor. And uh, he had a spear the size of a weaver's beam. I don't know exactly how heavy that is, but it sounds pretty heavy. And uh, uh, here comes David in his youth. And uh, uh, he... he he looked at the situation and he was enraged that they would be intimidated by this, this giant who was taunting them. And, uh, and so he used a sling and a stone uh, and he went out in the name of the Lord God and he killed Goliath with a stone from his slingshot. And uh, this story illustrates the way victory over th things that war against our soul and how they can be destroyed. When things come against us and taunt us and, and threaten us, and even though they're fearful, uh, even though your circumstances may be fearful, in the name of the Lord God, you can have the victory. Have some faith in God. Trust in Him. Believe Him. He's well able to help you. Hallelujah. Because it's not in your own strength. And you have to know that that little stone that David had, uh, God it was the one that took that stone and used it effectively to destroy the giant. And David wasn't out there on his own, and David knew that. And David understood that he wasn't walking out there on his own. He was walking out there in the name of the Lord. And this great victory brought David a lot of praise, but it enraged King Saul he made, it made him very jealous, uh, and he was jealous all the way to his grave against, King, against David. Uh, Saul's greatest desire for the remaining years of his life was to destroy David. Although David loved God and he wanted to please God, his life wasn't without spot. He committed a terrible sin after he became king. And while the armies of Israel are fighting against Amnon, David and Ease at the roof of his house um, saw a beautiful young woman bathing and uh, ended in adultery. Uh, uh, to make a long story short, David repented of that sin. God restored him. And uh, David continued to be the king. God continued to use him. Um, there was a desire within King David's life to, to be the one to build a beautiful temple unto the Lord of Jerusalem. But because David had been a man of war, uh, God desired for his son Solomon to build the temple. And so David reigned for 40 years, and then King Solomon took his, his son, took his place. And Solomon also reigned for 40 years, and it was under Solomon that the, the temple, the first temple, was, was built. Uh, all the way up into this time, from the time of Moses, all these hundreds of years, Israel had continued 
to worship uh, using the tabernacle in the wilderness, that Ark of the Covenant, that portable uh, structure that uh, God had given to Moses to build and uh, craftsmen of his day. Uh, and, and throughout those years, that had been the center of worship. Now they desired to convert that into, into a, a temple, an actual building. And in building this temple, uh, the temple was, of course, following the same pattern as the, as the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness. It included the holy place, the holy of holies. It included the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, the table of shoe bread, uh, and the, the, the menorah, the, the candles, the seven uh, lamps, the seven candlesticks. Uh, that all was in the temple that Solomon built. Uh, Solomon, in his early life, uh, when he first became king, God appeared to him in a dream and asked him what uh, he should do for him. And Solomon's answer was to have wisdom to guide God's people. God was pleased with that request. Not only did God give Solomon wisdom, but he gave him uh, great power and wealth also. Um, and so Solomon started out with a, with a heart for God. He was God's child. He was God's king. Uh, he had a right desire. Uh, it said when they built the temple that the glory of the Lord came into that place in such a powerful way that the, that the the priests could not stand to minister uh, because of the glory cloud that filled that temple when it was dedicated unto the Lord. King Solomon's reign was very powerful. It was the height of, of Israel's power as a nation at that time uh, and uh, had vast wealth and riches. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that um, within uh, the later years of Solomon's life, uh, he, he, he lost that pure heart that he had towards God. He had married many, many women who came from different nations and had different traditions and different gods, and, uh, and, and all of that stuff turned Solomon's heart away from, from being single-hearted towards the one true God. Uh, and, it, and it really brought disfavor uh, upon the nation of Israel. Uh, and, um, and when uh, the reins of the kingdom uh, were turned over to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, uh, Rehoboam uh, raised everybody's taxes. Um, and uh, things, were, things were kind of tense uh, when uh, Solomon was, uh, was king. Uh, after he had continued to raise taxes and raise taxes and people were, were uh, carrying this heavy tax burden and, and Solomon, you know, had the, had the power, he had the, the heritage, he had the, the, you know, the, the authority and the will of the, the goodwill of the people to at least keep that process going. Uh, but then uh, Rehoboam, his son, uh, when the people asked for some relief, he wanted to increase their taxes. And so that just, it turned everybody and the 10 northern tribes off. And they said, we're out of here. And, uh, and so this is when the kingdom of Israel went from a united kingdom uh, of all of these 12 tribes to a divided kingdom. And so we have the two tribes, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, down in the south, southern part of Israel, and then you had the 10 northern tribes. Uh, they made their capital city in Samaria. Judah continued to have its capital city in Jerusalem. And for the rest of Israel's history, uh, they remained a divided kingdom, unfortunately. Um, at least at that time. Israel, of course, is a nation. Now it is no longer a divided kingdom. But uh, that was, this of course is many years, many years from then. But at that time, it remained a divided kingdom. Uh, and it went through a series of kings in both kingdoms. And uh, let's talk about uh, the, the, the southern kingdoms under with Judah. Judah, as I said, the capital remained Jerusalem. The temple was in Jerusalem. Uh, they, re they maintained the worship of the one true God in the temple of Jerusalem. 
And there was various kings in the 9th century BC, 8th century BC, 7th century BC, 6th century. So several hundred years they maintained Jerusalem as the capital. And uh, th during this period of time they had good kings, evil kings, a uh, mix of good and bad. Uh, they had times of revival and they also had times of, 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 of backsliding. Um, but the, the worship of the one true God and the preaching of the prophets was centered in Jerusalem. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and this occurred all the way to their captivity in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. Why were they taken captive? Well, because of their uh, rebellion against the Lord. As you can see, several hundred years went by uh, and uh, God was very patient uh, at 586 B.C., they were taken captive, and they were in captivity in, the, in Babylon for 70 years. At the end of the 70 years, they were able to return to Jerusalem, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. On the northern ten tribes... Uh, under the leadership of Jeroboam, their first king, he established Samaria as the capital of this new kingdom. And he also made the tragic mistake of building a, a pagan temple and having a, a false god. In other words, they, they wanted to establish their own identity separate from Jerusalem and Judah and the southern tribes. Uh, unfortunately, in doing so, they left the one true God. They lost their connection to the one true God. They really lost their nation, national identity. They tried to create a new identity based upon this false God. Uh, but ultimately, the kingdom came to a, an end in 722 BC. And there was no restoration and no return from captivity for the northern tribes. And this is why they're known as the Lost Ten Tribes because nobody knows exactly where they went. There's some speculation as to where they arrived, but uh, they were lost to history. But I believe that they were lost in their identity because they first lost their, their relationship with God. Uh, the kings that followed Jeroboam continued to worship the false god that the first king Jeroboam had set up. You see, he made a, he started out on a wrong foot. And he set a bad precedent. And those generations that followed him continued to follow uh, that false God that he had established. Uh, whereas in Judah, uh, they for the most part continued to follow the one true God. There were times of serious backsliding, but then there would be a return to the true God. For example, particularly under the young king Josiah and others, there were some very good kings here. Uh, and so when they lost their, their nation, they still held on to their identity as the people of God, and they still returned to their capital and reestablished their temple, whereas uh, the ten tribes went into captivity and were lost to history. Under the divided kingdom, there were was, there was several prophets that uh, prophesied. Um, and many events that, that occurred, and we can you read about those in 1 uh, Kings and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, um, details the, the divided kingdom and all of the, the stories and the history, good and bad, of the kings and queens. And uh, it tells of the prophets like Elisha. It tells of, uh, of you know, the, um, uh, the, the good things that they did, the battles that they faced, um, uh, and so on. Uh, one particular story in the northern tribe is, uh, is when Isaiah, Elijah... Uh, and, and was prophesying, and of course, we, we, some of you may be familiar with the, with the, the, uh, uh, the, the altar that Elijah 
uh, built uh, in direct challenge to the, the priests of Baal uh, and how uh, Elijah put down a challenge to the priests of Baal to, to build an altar and call upon their God and he would call upon his true God and, and we'll see which God answers by fire and uh, and during this, during this time, they said, okay, and they built an altar to Baal, and they cried out to Baal, and nothing happened, and uh, they began to cut themselves and bleed and cry out to Baal, and nothing happened. Elisha prayed to God, and fire came down and just consumed the whole altar and, and the sacrifice and, and even the stones and all the wood, and, uh, and, the, and there was a time of repentance where people called upon the Lord. Uh, and that was, that was one of the stories that took place uh, in the ministry of Elijah when he was ministering there in the northern tribes of Israel. Another story is that of Elisha and Naaman. Naaman was a general in the Syrian, or a captain in the Syrian army. And uh, he had a servant girl from Israel, and uh, Naaman happened to be a leper. And one day the servant girl remarked, uh, 2 Kings 5.3, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of this leprosy. And so Naaman uh, sent word to have Elisha come, but Elisha sent a messenger uh, to him and go tell him, wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. Uh, 2 Kings 5.10. Uh, Naaman reluctantly obeyed and uh, after murmuring and complaining about it, uh, but he ultimately obeyed and he was healed. Um, even though Naaman didn't immediately follow the prophet's instructions, he, by doing so, uh, by oh, finally obeying, God healed him. And even though Naaman was a Syrian, uh, God healed him, and the result was giving glory to the God of Israel. And uh, uh, and it, it just shows you that obedience to God, no matter how silly it may seem to us, brings results. And we've got to trust God for it. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Naaman, to Naaman, it didn't make sense to him. Uh, but it did make a lot of sense after he was healed and he realized that God was indeed real. It was during this time that the other prophets uh, prophesied, like Isaiah, would prophesy of the, of the coming Messiah uh, many hundreds of years later. Isaiah would prophesy in Isaiah 35, 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for the wilderness shall waters break out and the streams in the desert. And Jesus went on to per, uh, perform many miracles during his time and he walked on the earth. And Jesus is still doing miracles today. Isaiah went on in chapter 53 to tell about uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah 53 and 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. When Israel went into exile, captivity, uh, the ten tribes previously had already gone into captivity in Assyria. Israel, or I'm sorry, Judah and the northern, the southern tribes rather, would go into captivity in Babylon. And God uh, would give them prophets to warn them and to uh, tell them to turn around and repent. And, and uh, ultimately, they did. Uh, and, uh, and so this is what led to their captivity in Babylon. Uh, but even during the time of captivity, uh, God moved prophets such as Ezekiel to encourage the people of God that uh, there was still hope. You know, even in the midst of judgment, even in the midst of despair, when by all accounts they should give up, God sent forth his prophets to encourage them that there was a time coming. For example, Ezekiel 
uh, would go on and he would prophesy about um, the, the valley of dry bones and how in this valley of dry bones that once again these bones would live, flesh would come upon these bones, life would come into these bodies again. Uh, and Israel would once again be a nation again. In Ezekiel 11, verse number 19, God says through Ezekiel, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take out the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And later on in Ezekiel 37, uh, they, they, uh, yeah, Ezekiel received this vision of the valley full of dry bones. Uh, and the question God asked Ezekiel was, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel said, oh Lord God, you know. That's a good response. And God said, prophesy to the bones. And God sent life into those bones as a promise to the people of God that though things look bleak now, there will be a nation again. It was during this time that Daniel, the prophet, uh, lived within Babylon and then within Persia. And God used Daniel in a mighty way uh, to stop the mouths of lions and, and uh, to be a witness in that pagan culture uh, he used Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, and uh, you know, in the fiery furnace, God, God uh, spared these young men uh, from being burnt up. In fact, they didn't even smell like smoke uh, when they came out of the furnace. It was also during this time that God used Queen Esther, a Jewish woman uh, who lived in Persia. And uh, she would be used by God to deliver the Israelites from the evil uh, uh, Haman who was out to destroy uh, the Jewish people. Uh, Queen's, uh, Queen Esther's prayer and her fasting and her courage to intervene uh, brought judgment upon Haman for his evil plot uh, and it saved uh, the people of Israel from uh, destruction. Just as God had just as God had promised Ezekiel and to Daniel um, and to others, they did come back to Jerusalem and, and they did uh, rebuild the temple under the leadership of Zerubbabel in 536 BC. And it was during this time that prophets Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi encouraged uh, and instructed the people. In 444 BC, Nehemiah returned and he uh, with uh, great leadership skills, he rebuilt the temple uh, in Jerusalem and brought great encouragement back to the people of God. And so God brought restoration, not only of the temple, but uh, of Jerusalem. And God continued to do work and, and miraculous things all the way up through the, the time when Christ was born for about 400 years later. Uh, this 400 years from the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, to the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, it's called the, 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 it's the period of silence. Uh, and it's not, it's not silent because there was no uh, word from the Lord, and it's just silent because there's no written word 